All right, so SHTF Guard coming back at you with some more uh, updates on what's going on. Current situation, so I got a few articles I wanted to go over and uh, make mention of in case people haven't seen it. This first one is an example of how fast things are changing. All right, so Trade Ministry Regulation on Wednesday, this is probably about a week old, said so the export policy would be reviewed monthly or as needed. This is developing palm oil from Indonesia. Chief Economics Minister, however you say his name, could be lifted by in bulk cooking oil. And here it goes. There's a little bit of this where I've highlighted some of it, so I'm reading from there. It'd be a great success. It won't take long. The market will be flooded. So you're talking about that they're going to be able to meet the demand for our palm cooking oil. And the reason why I wanted to uh, highlight this article here, let's put on there, pause it for a second in case anybody wants to stop and read what they're saying, because um, that's what we had here. We'll be able to meet demand. And it goes into some numbers, the amount of their currency that's sold and all this other stuff. An hour later, they banned the export of palm oil completely, 100%. So I run there one hour later. It's about an hour later, literally was. Maybe an hour and some change or a little less than an hour actually, I think. And then here's a statement from their president. Once domestic needs have been met, of course I will lift the export ban because I know the country needs taxes, foreign exchange, trade balance surplus. Meeting the people's basic needs is more important priority. Because he said in the statement that more affordable food trumped revenue concerns. All right, so they're talking about it's ironic that they're facing cooking oil shortage as being a producer themselves. And the new rules were due to take effect at midnight local time, 1700 Greenwich Meridian time. And the Navy, they have their Navy out enforcing the ban. Okay, put that up there. And they've been instructed to set up patrols in Indonesian waters to ensure compliance. Navy spokesman Julius so-and-so, whatever name is said. Palm oil futures in Malaysia exchange surged by 9.8% Wednesday. I guess it was about a week or so old. At the some uh, market participants, participants feared exports to Indonesia, the world's biggest palm oil producer, could not get their products on board a vessel before the ban started. So they go on to complain about that. It's a drastic measure to rein in the prices. We hope uh, this has the intended effect within a short period to avoid hurting the industry. This is crazy. We're paying a price for Indonesia flip flops. They're getting mad about it. Every vegetable oil is going through the roof. Security supplies of vegetable oils based shipments is a challenge, said New Delhi based dealer um, with a global trading firm. They didn't say what the firm was. All right, so if you have yours by April 27th, those orders were in, they would still be honored. Anything past that, and of course it's obviously past that, this was past that when this article came out. Um, that they could still ship those products. Anything after April 27th, it's done. So any kind of uh, orders that were in place after that, mm -mm, not getting those. The export ban will be reviewed monthly or as often as needed. So reviewing it monthly or as often as needed is a nice way. Of, you know, it's kind of like yeah, a little diplomatic, but you're not getting your stuff. We'll we'll get back. You we'll call you. You don't call us. Type of thing. And since it's impossible to get a vessel instantly, everything would have to be chartered. So. Some people were trying to hurry up and get their stuff offloaded before this ban took place, but they, of course, are not able to. So let's grab the next thing in the stack here. All right. This one right here is one I got from today. And they're talking about, they're kind of complaining about the cost going up because the Biden administration has a uh, promise, I think it's $670 million for food assistance. I'm not too worried about that aspect of the article because giving food assistance out in the middle of a crisis like this, I don't think is necessarily a bad thing. But anyways, the reason behind this one is it goes into some of the other stuff. Russia claimed the Black Sea ports were being mined by Ukraine and the mines are floating into the sea. All right, so you see at the top. All right, so they're saying mine is drifted, mines are drifted into the Black Sea, breaking off from cables near Ukraine's ports, and a claim dismissed by Ukraine was said was disinformation. Of course. Russia could be the one to put the mines out. Ukraine could have put the mines out. Who knows who put the mines out? But the idea is there are mines out there in the water 
blocking shipping lanes. All right, they go down as uh, Black Sea's a major shipping artery for grain oil, uh, oil products. Regardless of who planted the mines, the problem is that millions of tons of grain from Ukraine is not making it out of the country. All right, so it's not, regardless of who put the mines there, it's just not going out. Millions of extra tons of grains have been sitting in silos in Odessa and other Ukraine ports, and more grain stranded on ships due to the conflict. The WPF, sorry, WFP has called these for these ports to be reopened so farmers have a place to store their harvest next year. So that's causing a ripple effect. What you're getting is you got grains stored up from last year's season, haven't been able to be exported because of the war, so they're still sitting in the silos. Now, if they are able to plant some grains, which in a lot of cases they're not, but if what grains are being planted, now they don't have anywhere to store them. So these grains are just sitting in a silo, not being used. They're not being exported. And uh, I saw some other articles. In fact, I was going to print one out, but then I forgot about it. <laughs> I was distracted by so many other things. That those grain silos are being looted by Russian forces. Which goes back to something I alluded to before in a prior video. That my personal feelings is part of the reason for this war because people in the know have been knowing that this food shortage has been coming for a while that maybe one of the reasons for this war is it's a, it's a resource war 70 percent of ukraine is farmland and maybe that might be a reason why russia wants it with this grand solar minimum and the food shortages and all the kind of stuff that's happening the fact is that they could use that extra food going on and that's just my personal pet theory of one of the reasons for the conflict could be wrong but they're looting the grain and now the grain that's that they was trying to get out isn't getting out so now any new grain that they do have they don't have a place to put it which obviously means it would go to waste and that's what they're talking about right now ukraine's grain silos are full at the same time 44 million people around the world are marching towards starvation Throw that up there so you can see it. Maybe see the website I got it from at the bottom. All right, so let's continue on the next thing. All right, so they want to open the uh, ports so the food can move out because hundreds of millions of people globally depend on these supplies. We're running out of time. The cost of inaction will be higher than anyone can imagine. That That's true. And then they go on to talk about the $670 million in food assistance, um, global historic levels of global food insecurity point of the matter is it doesn't matter how much money they try and throw at the stuff if the food is not there then it doesn't matter how much money you got because you can't buy something that's not there all right so let's talk about a little bit of the fertilizer stuff I mentioned that a few times and i'm sure if you're watching this you probably watched a lot of other people's videos about this stuff as well so this is going into fertilizer issue so you got alarming signs of, of farmers reducing fertilizer may wreck crop yields and one of the reasons why i wanted to highlight this is because i have another story in the stack here well they're talking about they don't need these fertilizers they could still get the same yield without putting on the fertilizers so which is it the fact that they're using the fertilizers and they're paying money for these fertilizers means they need them if they could just do without the fertilizers don't you think they would have done that you know that's just a normal business thing saying hey i don't need to spend this extra x amount of dollars i can save that pad profit margin if i'm if i can get away by using the fertilizers they're using them because they have to but anyways that's kind of a side here growing concern farmers worldwide reducing chemical fertilizers may threaten yields come harvest time yeah no kidding then they go into uh they're decreasing essential nutrients and you know np and k so they're they're lowering the use of np and k nitrogen phosphorus and potassium all right, so and then this particular article is talking about coffee in particular. Coffee farmers in Brazil, Nicaragua, Guatemala, Costa Rica, and some of the largest coffee producing countries. Um, they're expected to spread less fertilizer because of high costs and shortages. Coffee output could slip 15% due to the rising uh, fertilizer costs. What was the last time they were ever accurate by these numbers, by the way? Just, so you, just to throw it out there, if they say 15%, it's probably more like 20% or 25%. But they're not going to spook the markets by saying that. They're always going to err on the side of better news, you know, than in reality. International Fertilizer um, Development Center, IFDC, which I didn't even know was a real thing, warned a uh, reduction in fertilizer would uh, shrink yields of rice, corn, come harvest time. 
Farmers in China, India, Bangladesh, Indonesia, and Vietnam, the largest rice producing countries, are spread less fertilizer this year, may have a 10% reduction, equaling 36 million tons of rice or enough to feed half a billion people. If that's what they're expecting, and that's assuming nothing goes wrong, that's assuming you don't have any kind of bad weather or any other shortages come along for inputs. They're willing to admit this on an international you know, website that anybody can read this on public information. They're willing to say that out in public. What is it really like behind the scenes? That's, you got to ask them. Are more fertilizer equals more food production? Yeah, no kidding. U.S. won't be spared. Some of the biggest fear of the spring is that farmers in North America may skip out on applying nitrogen to wheat plantings. And their biggest concern is we'll end up with a very severe short food shortage in certain parts of the world. And, of course, less fertilizer, less quality. And that's another thing. All right. And so there's a lot to digest when it comes to that. I haven't said anything about taking a master gardener's course because I wanted to wait till I graduated and then like, Hey, here's my plaque. But I've been taking a master gardener's class and I'm probably half, probably a little more than halfway through it now. And that's one of the things that has been discussed in the class is about the nitrogen fertilizer in particular. Now they haven't been focusing on it too much as a political thing, but just talking about this is our normal recommendations for this, you know, amount of, you know, this square footage and this, you know, you look at these soil tests and whatnot. So when you, but when you get into talking about that kind of stuff and they're realizing that phosphorus and potassium is generally in the soil already. You may need some more, you may not, depending on your soil quality, but you always need nitrogen because it's water soluble so it washes out with the rain. So you always have to add nitrogen if you expect to get any kind of decent yield. That's right out of the Master Gardener's course. And um, they just don't have that right now. So... Your nitrogen numbers when you do a soil test will pretty much always come out needing some nitrogen. I just want to throw that out there because when you look at the amount of fertilizers that are being inputted, and that's just if you have, you know, regular soil, you have good soil, you got compost, whatever the case may be in your garden, or in this case, farming, because the Master Gardener's course deals a lot with, with farming type of stuff as well as, you know, not just your backyard garden. A lot of it's dealing with that. And so whenever you... Uh, you look at these kind of inputs that's needed on large scale. These soils that they're farming in is the same exact ones that's been farmed for decades. The soil is dead. It needs the fertilizer. If you've been farming since 1940 on, you know, this hundred acres of corn, corn is a very heavy feeder. There ain't nothing left in that soil. It's dirt and you have to add fertilizer. Anyways, I'm going off on a tangent. All right. Here's one they're talking about. Well, they don't need it. Okay. But then you read further down, they do. So major Brazil soybean uh, grower cut fertilizer amid shortage. And they're talking about one of Brazil's largest farmers planning to reduce fertilizer by a quarter next season, relying more on precise applications and soil testing. Okay. And then uh, they call it, it goes in to say it's SLC Agricola. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. SA, which cultivates an area bigger than Delaware. That's a lot of farmland. With soybeans, corn, and cotton, will probably use between 20 and 25% less fertilizer. And then they say they're not going to jeopardize yields doing that. I call BS on that. Last article we just talked about less fertilizer, less production. And that's obvious. And they're saying that they can get away with that by a better application of it. If they could do that, they would have done it already because that would, you know, be, make business sense. And then it goes and has a nice little chart showing, you know, where they get their fertilizer from. You notice a lot of it comes from Russia and some from Belarus, which are both um, engaged in conflict right now and not um, able to sell their fertilizer to anybody. And then, so you skip down a little bit. So the majority of farmers will probably adopt the same strategy. Yeah, that's part of the problem. Now, here's part of that I, I wanted to point out here that was interesting in here. This is SLC has secured 83% of the potassium it's planning to apply next year, or next season, that's this year. Half the phosphorus um, hasn't bought nitrogen. All right, so I'm going to highlight this here at the bottom. The reason why that's so important is they're planning on doing 20 to 25% less. So if you say 75 to 80% 
is what you're planning on doing, then you only have 83% of that 75% to 80%. Then you only have half of that 75 to 80%. And then you have zero for nitrogen, which we just discussed um, is always needed. So if you're planning to reduce 25% to 20, 25%. And then you've only got some of what you're still planning to get. So it's it's not that they have 83% of the potassium that they need. They have 83% of the reduction that they're trying to get. So they have, they're they trying to get 75% and they only have 83% of that 75%. And they have nothing of nitrogen and only half the phosphorus. So they're coming up way short of what their already short plan is. That's not good. I mean, it's May. I mean, I mean, I, I, this is a different part of the world, so, but still, I mean, this is, I mean, planting season's here. And then they're talking about only 15% of Brazil's agriculture areas can sustain itself without fertilizers, according to some soil testing they did. It says about 80% of Brazil's agriculture areas still is very reliant on fertilizers. So the idea that they're going to just not use as much fertilizer and, and still get the same yields is just hogwash. That's feel goodery so that they can tell people they're still going to put out in this X amount, not spook the markets or whatever, but it's just not going to happen. Um, I hope I'm wrong about that, but I just don't think it's going to happen. All right. And then they're talking about one of the areas with uh, the richest soil in Brazil. They did some test cutting fertilizer and they were successful. But then you go down to the next paragraph, even in the fertile areas where they cut fertilizer, they still the uh, the pro the yield still declined, but their profitability didn't. So it, all that tells me is they just raised their prices. They produced less and raised their prices uh, for what they did grow. All right, and here's the last one I wanted to go over because I don't make the video too long. I could go on and on and on. Uh, this is just a handful of articles from the past week or so. All right, so here is inclement weather adding to the mix all right so they've had five record presenting awesome years for um crop growth in india and so india was going to step up and try and help fill some of the gap from ukraine and all this stuff by producing more wheat and all that so they were that was their plan and here we go after five consecutive years of record harvest the world's second biggest producer of uh, wheat the second biggest producer um, is hit by a huge heat wave. And see, they're talking about, they're expecting the, excuse me, expecting another record crop. They expected to export 12 million tons. That was their expectation. You see those videos, expectations versus reality, right? And says the government has yet to formally revise its production estimates. Of course they have it. They don't want to tell anybody. And you skip down loss, uh, loss of production, wheat, all India bases more or less around 6%. On account of shriveling wheat grains, around 20%. It's expecting 6% loss because 20% shriveled. Hmm. Okay. Due to thermal heat and heat waves. And then to skip down a little bit, uh, they have some initial idea, but it's too early to uh, underestimate, to, to underestimate, to understand the extent of crop loss. And then they were talking about, they were expecting to export 12 million tons. Now they're talking, eh, maybe more like 10 million tons. I think that's probably still optimistic. But assuming they get 10 million tons, assuming they do, and it's not um, damaged further by another heat waves, droughts, or anything else, and everything goes fine from here on out, and they get their 10 million tons, that's still 2 million tons less than what they were expecting. So that means it's 2 million tons off the market because of this one weather anomaly. Under any normal year, this wouldn't have mattered because you have so many different countries producing. But right now, everybody's scrambling. Everybody's hurting. Everybody's got fertilizer shortages. You got war in some areas, supply chains in other areas. Then you're not even talking about getting into refrigeration trucks and cargo container ships and all the rest to transport this around truckers, shortages, and all the rest of this stuff. But see, every, uh, things tend to change the further down you read. Down here, they're talking about a ten, uh, maybe as much as 10%. So earlier in the article, they're talking about 6% with 20% shrivel. Further down, they're like, yeah, well, maybe it's more like 10% what we're actually going to, you know, actually lose. And so just wanted to throw out there because that was one of the things that was part of the discussion 
you know, as well, India is going to try and help make up for some of the losses from um, Ukraine. But now India is having problems and they were the second, you know, the second biggest producer. They had a lot of stuff. So now you're like, well, where is this going to come from? You go right now they're saying there's 44 million people that are possibly looking at severe shortages up to hundreds of millions of people if they can't get the, the cranes out of Ukraine due to mines or whatever is actually going on there. And then you're talking about, well, now you got fertilizer shortages in Brazil. So if you're not getting the wheat, well, maybe you can try and substitute. Maybe you can make some things with soybean or something like that. Well, those are only getting a percentage of the lower amounts of fertilizer they're planning on getting. In the case of nitrogen, they haven't bought any yet. So you're talking zero, and that's the biggest, most important nutrient that you need. So you're starting to paint a really grim picture here. So I'm hoping that everybody who's seeing this, if they're able to, are buying something extra every time they go to the store. They're buying an extra pound or a couple pounds of rice. They're buying some extra um, dehydrated potatoes. They're buying some uh, extra canned goods. And one thing I like to throw out there is when you're getting your stuff to make bread, um, because bread has been a staple of, you know, in human you know, society for a long time, you can get a lot of your calories from bread that's been done for centuries, maybe thousands of years. Um, one way you can make bread a little easier if you don't have or um, if you're planning on storing the stuff for a long time is to get some um, get some self-rising flour i made an example loaf uh, i cooked yesterday actually at a bread machine and that came out i mean it wasn't quite as light and fluffy and delicious as you know bread that you would make um, with yeast but i used sugar oil self-rising flour and water those four ingredients slapped in a bread machine turned it on a few hours later it had mixed and sat and stirred and baked and everything. And it popped out a not bad loaf. I mean, throw a little butter on it and I was eating it. I like it. I'm down with that. So it's just something to throw out there whenever you're doing some preps. Um, Self-rising flour makes for some easy bread. Uh, obviously, uh, you can get better quality bread with using yeast and stuff. But don't neglect self-rising flour. If, uh, you should try a loaf if you have a, um, the time and inclination to prepare by trial and error so maybe you might want to try that as a loaf of bread but anyways i'm probably going way off pick up some extra supplies shortages are getting worse right now we're still surviving the last year's harvest but that's not going to be the case come october you know august september whenever the new stuff starts coming in and the old stuff is going out that's when the shortages are really going to start getting noticeable because they're not going to have as much and as it goes on just like I said before in my other video, we we're talking about my three-month rule of gardening, where you have to have enough. If you're trying to store away for winter time, my winter here is six months. So I really need nine months of food stored up. Six months for the winter, three more months to give my garden some time to start producing again because it takes that long to get potatoes. It takes that long to get tomatoes. It takes that long to get... And of course, you can obviously, you know start stuff in a greenhouse or on your kitchen table with seeds and you know plastic covering you could try and mitigate that but you need time for your garden to begin to produce so in this particular case it's not your garden aspect it's the it's bigger scale so whenever the farmers have to go so you your harvest comes in you know august september you know october when that stuff is coming in when the other stuff is petering out there has to be enough coming in to last all winter long, the entire planting season, and all the way back to the next harvest. That's a whole year. So it's going to be a whole year's worth of stuff. So it's not going to be able to be replaced anytime soon. What they harvest in harvest season, that's what they've got for a whole year. Uh, planet wide. I mean, you, of course, you have obviously different hemispheres and stuff. So you might, you'll get a second hit in the middle of there somewhere. But it's going to be a long um, time before that comes back around so make sure that you have the resources you need put up now so that whenever it's expensive and hard to find and everybody's scrambling come october and september that you already have some extra 
pounds of flour and you've already got some canned goods and you've got seeds to grow for the following season because you're going to want to grow potatoes lots of potatoes. i'm growing at least 100 pounds myself um and then you're going to want to grow some stuff but anyways i have going on and on and on i have some videos about those potatoes coming out because i've been planting and doing my thing with the, with the garden and i've been recording it and recording it and just haven't released it yet so i've just been doing updates and so stay tuned for that like share subscribe click the notification bell try and spread this message around not for my gratification although you know it's kind of cool when people watch videos and stuff but so that more people can get prepared the more people get prepared the less people's going to be out there rioting for food whenever the shortages do happen friends and family neighbors whatever and if you're growing something in your backyard hopefully you got enough seeds for your neighbor to grow that way they won't need to take yours they'll have their own and try and build that community because we're going to need it anyways shtf garden out